the next step toward deriving the um, aggregate demand curve and understanding aggregate demand in the model is uh, to set up the budget constraint of the household. And then that will allow us, given that we already have the utility function of the household, to set up the problem of the household, solve it, and then get uh, be able to characterize aggregate demand. Um, so let's try to uh, figure out what the budget constraint is. Um, first step, let's try to figure out what the income of the household is in the model. So there are two components to income. First one, obviously, is that uh, the you know how the workers in the household work, they get labor income. That's the first source of income that we can uh, consider. Uh, so what's the labor income in the household? Um, so first of all, uh, how many people are going to work in our uh, in the household, well, um, how many? So we have to start with how many people are available to work in the household. So that's basically how many people in the household are in the labor force. So this we said was H. So H workers are available to work. Now, of course, you know we have a matching model. Not of all of these workers are going to fa to have a job at any point in time. In fact, we know that there is an unemployment rate. So the unemployment rate is u of t, so the employment rate is 1 minus u of t, and so 1 minus u of t times h. These are the number of household members who have a job. So this, let me flag this. So this is the number of workers in the labor force. Once you multiply this by 1 minus u, this is the number of workers with a job. Okay. Now, um, so all these guys are working for households. How much are they producing? Well, we know that each household, uh, each worker produces A services per unit time. So these, oh, sorry, these guys are going to produce uh, A services per unit time. So this is just productivity. And so A times 1 minus UT times H, this is a total, this is a number of services um, sold by the household uh, per unit time. And so to transform this into an income, we have to know what is the price of a service. And in the model, we are going to assume that all services have a price PT. price of a service. And you know, we'll talk later about how prices are determined, but we know here we'll have to assume a price norm for the price of services, and we'll get to that. Um, but for the labor income, the only thing we need to know is all of this. So this is our labor income, PTA1 minus UT times H. Uh, all right, so that's one source of income. What's another source of income for the, ho for the household? Well, it's uh, investment income because um, we know that households, uh, they save using government bonds. And of course, these governments have an, have a, an interest rate. Um, and so the household is going to, uh, the household is going to collect uh, income from this, uh, from this savings and government bond. Um, so we have investment, or if you want saving income, and so, uh, how many bonds uh, do they hold? So we'll just call BT the amount of bonds. Uh, so these are number of bonds, government bonds, of course, held by the household. And then we'll and then we'll say that all of these government bonds they pay a nominal interest rate, which we'll call IT. Um, and so, IT is just so nominal uh, 
uh, interest rate, you know, uh, per unit time. And so, of course, IT times BT, that's uh, the income that's earned by the household from holding bonds at time T. So that's the total interest from bond holdings. Okay, uh, so these are the two sources of income. Now, oh, I guess, uh, right. And then what's, so now we have to look at the sources of uh, expenditure. So uh, what does the household spend on? First, uh, the household is of course going to buy services from other households. Okay, um, so how many uh, services is the household going to buy? Well, so first you have CT, that's the consumption. Uh, so this is the number of services consumed uh, by the household at T. But now we know that, um, of course, if the household want to consume city, the household has to actually uh, buy more services because the household has to allocate some of the services that it uh, purchases to recruiting. Uh, because we know that, you know, the household uh, hires a bunch of workers, a bunch of butlers if you want, but some of these butlers have to be uh, devoted to, uh, to recruiting, to filling vacancies, because the household is constantly losing some butlers and so the household is supposed vacancy to replace these butlers and filling these vacancies requires uh, recruiters right and what we had said is that uh, for any unit of consumption the household has in addition to devote tau of theta units of uh, services to recruiting you know per unit of consumption and tau of theta is our recruiting wage so it's a gap between consumption and output caused by the fact that certain part of output is devoted to recruiting. So if the household consumes CT, the total amount of services that are bought is one plus tau of theta T times CT. Uh, so tau of theta, of course, here is our recruiting wage. And one plus tau of theta CT here, this is the number of services that are actually purchased Um, by the household at time and you know these services they are provided by the workers that are employed um, by the household uh, you know and here services and workers is kind of the same because any worker provides a services but you know, deciding how many services you buy or how many workers you hire is uh, is just equivalent okay so these are the number of services purchased and how much do these services cost well we said that the price of services was just pt so we can multiply this by pt um, is just the price of a service. And down the line, this will be given by a price norm. All right, so here we have our expenditure on services. Um, what other expenditure do we have? Well, we know that um, the government is issuing bonds. These bonds pay uh, an interest to the bondholders. And so of course the government has to finance this interest payment and this will be financed with a lump sum tax. So. Um, the lump sum tax, of course, has to then be paid by the household. So in addition, you have uh, a lump sum tax to uh, finance interest payment. And so that lump sum tax will just call it T of T, uh, capital T of T. Uh, and that, that's just used by the government to balance its budget. All right, so now we have all the income, all the expenditure. We can build uh, the budget constraint. And so here we'll just build it in nominal term. So budget constraint says that the, you know, 
the household has a certain amount of income. So we said the income was uh, IT, BT, that uh, interest income plus PT, A1 minus UT, H, um, that's labor income minus PT, one plus star of theta, I guess yes, there's a T as well, CT, okay, minus T of T. So this is a lump sum tax. So here we have income minus expenditure. Well, what happens if you have more income than expenditure, then you'll be able to save a little bit. So if this is positive, savings will go up. So, and here all everything is saved in government bonds. So holding of government bonds will go up. If this is negative, you have to de-save to finance um, you know, you are to, uh, yes, if this is negative, it means that you spend more than your income. So you have to de-save to finance this extra expenditure. So basically the gap between income and expenditures, this is just the change in bond holdings, B dot T. Okay, so that's the nominal budget constraint. Um, this is just a change in, uh, savings, which is just the same as nominal wealth at time t. Okay, and this change in nominal wealth or savings is driven by the gap between income and uh, expenditure. Now, to simplify, because at the end, our model will express this in real terms, we have to, we can uh, reshuffle this to get a budget constraint in real term. And so to do that, I have to introduce uh, the household's uh, real stock of bond. So the nominal stock of bond is BT. Uh, and so this pair, like, you know, is just the stock of bond in nominal terms. Then we want to have here the real stock of bond. So discounting the nominal stock of bond by the price level. the real stock of bond and will denote it by WT, uh, you know, and my new WT is what we have used for our real wealth uh, earlier. Uh, and here is because all real wealth is held as bond. So real stock of bond is WT and is just defined as BT divided by PT. Okay. Um, so it's just the amount of bond that you have divided by the price level. Here, because we'll have a budget constraint in real term, we'll see that it's not the nominal interest rate that will show up in there, but the real interest rate. So let's define the real interest rate. Let's denote it by RT as usual, and it's just a nominal interest rate minus the inflation rate. So here I introduce the inflation rate pi T. And the inflation rate, uh, the inflation rate is just the rate of growth of the price level. So it's P dot T divided by PT. Uh, okay, and this is so IT do remember that the nominal interest rate. So it's the interest it's the interest rate that paid on the nominal stock of bonds. RT, so that are going to be our real interest rate. Okay, and so now that I've introduced this new variable, so I've introduced real wealth, real interest rate, and inflation. Um, so I can, I'm going to be able to rewrite my budget uh, my budget constraint in real terms. So the key thing is that given that real wealth is nominal wealth divided by the price level, uh, then, you know, we can uh, take logs of this. So we know that uh, log of WT is log of uh, the bonds, nominal bonds minus log of PT. And then if I take the derivative of this, with respect to time, I get that W dot of T 
Here's it by double duty. So here I divide a result back to time. I get double duty divided by t. So the growth of the real wealth is equal to b dot t over b t. So the growth of nominal wealth minus p dot t over p t once I derive. So the growth of the price level, and so that's b dot t over b t minus pi t. So as usual, you know, the rate of growth of a real variable is the rate of growth of the nominal variable minus the inflation rate, you know, totally standard. Um, so thanks to that expression, I know that w dot the t, the rate of change of real wealth, which is what I want to introduce in my budget constraint, it's going to be w t the real wealth times b dot t over bt minus pi t times w t. Okay, so here I've just multiplied both sides of my ex expression by w t. But now, of course, uh, the key thing is that w t, which is real wealth, divided by bt, which is uh, nominal wealth, that's just uh, 1 over pt. OK, so and that's, that's just by definition. And so this allows me to rewrite w dot dot t. It's going to be b dot t divided by pt. So the so change in real wealth is the change in nominal wealth divided by the price level minus inflation rate times real wealth. Okay, that, that's a super helpful expression here. So it means that I can express my budget constraint in real term from the budget constraint in nominal terms divided by the price level minus uh, the inflation rate times the real, we times the real wealth. Okay, and so using this, and using the expression here that we have for uh, the budget constraint in nominal term, what do I get? So I'm going to combine these two things. So I get that uh, I get my real budget constraint. So it says that w dot do, uh, sorry, w dot of t. So the change in real wealth. So I have all the terms from the previous budget constraint divided by p. Uh, so that's going to be uh, it times. Uh, so that's interest income times nominal wealth divided by pt. So that's real wealth. That's w t. Plus, then I have my labor income but divided by PD, so it's just A, 1 minus UT times H, minus spending divided by PT, so that's just going to be uh, 1 plus tau theta T CT, minus uh, the lump sum tax divided by PT, and then I have to subtract minus pt times wt. And here you notice I have it, so here I have real wealth times nominal interest rate, and I subtract real wealth times inflation rate. So if I combine these two things, I'll get real wealth times real interest rate. That's, that's how the real interest rate shows up. So I get, once I combine this thing, I get my final expression. w dot dot t is just rt, the real interest rate, wt, so the change in real wealth is a real interest rate on the current stock of real wealth plus the real labor income minus real spending minus taxes in real terms. And so this is our budget constraint here in real terms. And of course, because the households only care about things in real terms, 
this is a budget that we'll use in the household uh, problem. And you can see it says that the change in real wealth is return on real wealth plus real income minus real spending. And real spending is both uh, spending on services and, and also tax payment.